listener note, this story contains adult content and language. In the spring and early summer of 2012, Dr. Christopher Dench didn't have privileges to work at any hospital. Kimberly Morgan, who had been his medical assistant and his girlfriend, had left him. Some of the rumors among surgeons were that Kimberly had actually coached him through a few of his surgeries. Now, she was gone. It wasn't a smooth breakup. He showed up at her house at 2 a.m. one night and started banging on her window. Since he wasn't able to operate anywhere, there wasn't a lot for his remaining staff to do. They played games, they read magazines, they stared at their phones. They noticed changes in the boss. He became depressed. He would come in and not say anything. He looked disheveled. He looked like he hadn't bathed. That's B.J. Ellison, his office manager. He um, might come in, not say anything, and leave, and this would be weeks at a time. His patients came in for checkups, and he told them he'd be doing their operations any day now. Telling them that as soon as we had privileges at a certain place that he wanted because of their up-to-date technology, then we would do surgery. Dunch's ways were starting to bother her. I do not think it's ethical to keep stringing along patients that desperately need surgery without referring them on. I don't think it's right. I had also heard Dr. Dunch tell a patient that he was going to open a multi-billion dollar clinic with the best and the greatest of neurosurgery. And I'm listening to this, thinking this is one big lie. This was right after his stint at Baylor Plano. Every patient Dunch had operated on since that December had had major complications. Pain, paralysis, death. From there, he went on to Dallas Medical Center, where two of his three surgeries ended in disaster. After Floella Brown's surgery, B.J. Ellison finally realized the same thing her friend Kimberly Morgan had. Jerry Summers, Kelly Martin, Floella Brown, Mary Eford, these had not all been tragic flukes. She quit, and before she left, Ellison called all the patients she could and all the hospitals she knew where he was applying and told them, do not let him near you. Do not let him near any patient. And why did you do that? I didn't want him to have privileges anywhere, ever. What were you afraid of? Someone dying or never walking again, being paralyzed. And what went through your mind when you learned that he had kept operating even after he left Dallas Medical Holy shit. That's what I thought. How are you people letting him operate? I'm sorry, that's vulgar, but that's what I thought. What in the heck is going on? From Wondery, I'm Laura Beal, and this is Dr. Death. This is episode four, Spineless. If Baylor Plano had fired Dunch outright at the first sign of trouble, this story could have ended right there. That would mean that after the operation on his friend Jerry Summers, there would have been no injury to Mary Eford or to Shirley Mock. Floella Brown and Kelly Martin would still be alive if they had fired him. Instead, Dr. Dench operated 29 more times after Jerry Summers. Baylor Plano allowed his abrupt departure to seem voluntary. He would go on to Dallas Medical Center and then on to still more hospitals. Why? Because when Baylor Plano let him resign, they failed to do two important things. The first thing that they didn't do was report him to the state medical board. The number one role of any state medical board uh, is uh, to protect the public. Number one. That's, that's their number one responsibility. That's Dr. Henderson. Baylor could have told the board that they had conducted an investigation and found that one of their surgeons had severely mangled two operations in a row. 
The medical board is a panel of physicians appointed by the governor, and anyone can report a doctor to them. The second thing they didn't do was that they did not report him to the National Practitioner Data Bank. The data bank is basically a way of keeping up with America's worst doctors. It was set up in the 1980s as a way to improve the quality of health care. The intention was to keep bad doctors from sneaking from hospital to hospital or state to state by keeping a national record of things that they'd done. You and I can't see this list. Other doctors can't see this list. One reason is that some reports are minor and depending on the context don't necessarily mean a doctor's dangerous. But hospitals can see it. And before they give privileges to a doctor, they must check to see if their new recruit is on it. A major report to the data bank, like getting fired over mangled surgeries, can make it almost impossible to find a job. If Baylor had fired Dr. Dunch outright, they would have been required by law to report him to the data bank. Instead, they gave him a letter in April of 2012 that, while not exactly glowing, strongly implied that he'd left on good terms. It said, all investigations with respect to any areas of concern regarding Christopher Dunch, MD, have now been closed. As of this date, there have been no summary or administrative restrictions or suspension of Dr. Dunch's medical staff membership or clinical privileges during the time he has practiced at Baylor Regional Medical Center at Plano. Dr. Henderson was shown that letter by the Dallas Medical Center administrator the day he was called in to take care of Mary Eford. It was a short, brief, concise uh, letter. And that was pretty amazing because everybody in the rooms uh, at this time was aware of the fact that he'd had two catastrophic uh, surgeries at least at that hospital. Basically, Baylor got rid of him in a way that saved themselves a lot of red tape and legal fuss. Kick the can down the road. Protect yourself first. Protect the doctor second and make it be somebody else's problem. It didn't make sense to me why Baylor would want to protect Dr. Dunch. So I talked to Kay Van Way, a Dallas malpractice attorney who would end up representing more than a dozen of Dr. Dunch's patients. She would join Dr. Henderson's effort to stop Christopher Dunch. Van Way explained, that had Baylor fired and reported him, then they'd be the ones who could be saddled with a bunch of legal bills. Then if Dr. Dunch was unable to get privileges at other hospitals, theoretically Dr. Dunch could have sued Baylor and said, look, I could be making $2 million a year here and you've, you made a wrong decision about me, you didn't have enough evidence on me and you've ruined my career and you owe me $2 million for the rest of my life. Now, let's be clear. With his track record, it would be absurd for Dr. Dunch to make a credible case that he was treated unfairly. But the fear of being sued and that culture of silence is real. So real that a watchdog group called Public Citizen did a study a few years back to see how often hospitals do this. They found that more than half the hospitals in the country had never reported a single doctor. Dallas Medical Center, where two of Dunch's three cases ended tragically, didn't report him either. So you might be wondering if his name ever made it to the data bank. Their reports aren't available to the public, but I was able to get my hands on Dr. Dunch's from an outside source. Christopher Dunch was finally reported by Methodist Hospital in the Dallas suburb of McKinney. He never worked there, but he applied. And based on what they learned happened at Baylor, Methodist McKinney rejected his application and did what Baylor should have done, report him to the databank. But if you'll please leave your name, number, and a detailed message, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thanks and have a great day. Record your message. As you might imagine, I had a lot of questions for Baylor. I sent emails and left voicemail messages for months. Hi, Nikki. It's Laura Beal. I just wanted to see if you had gotten my last email. I have some more questions. If you could give me a call back. Thank you. Administration. 
Sherry. But Dr. Henderson did talk to them. Hi, Sherry. This is Dr. Robert J. Henderson. I need to speak to your CEO or your administrator of the hospital. Okay. Um, Jerry Garrison is our president. Would that be the person you want to speak to? Jerry Garrison. Okay, fine. Uh, Hold on one second. Thank you. This was on July 30th, 2012, just after Dr. Henderson had operated on Mary Eford at Dallas Medical Center. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Jerry. This is Dr. Robert J. Henderson. Jerry Garrison is the president of Baylor Plano. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm hoping you can help me with a problem. Um, oh, my bad. Are you familiar with a um, neurosurgeon by the name of Dr. Dunce, Christopher Dunce? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, so am I, unfortunately. I became aware of him on Friday. Dr. Henderson tells Garrison about Floella Brown, the woman who never woke up after falling unconscious the morning after her surgery. Then he tells Garrison about the patient he was brought in to operate on, Mary Eford. Put it bluntly, I'm concerned whether or not he's had any training whatsoever in spine surgery. Anyone in that operating room could have done a better job, Henderson says. He was trying to do a pliff at L5-S1. He starts listing off the damage. Uh, As near as I can tell, he may have destroyed four nerves on the left side. I mean, destroyed them, like transected them. He talks about a screw lost in Mary Eford's body. He actually put the pliff device in the left psoas muscle, tried to put a pedicle screw lateral to that in the left psoas muscle and lost it. And how Floella Brown had died. And the radiologist said it was a massive air embolism to the brain with infarction of brain tissue. And then he gets to the reason for his call. um, And then I heard he had problems at your hospital. Is that correct? No longer had problems with him. I have to be very careful what I say to you. Right. But Dr. Henderson knows that bad things happened at Baylor. No, and he's wondering, well, what on earth is going on? i tell you what, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable talking about this. But we had a very similar procedure and we tried our very best to make sure that he didn't get privileges. And he were out. Anywhere, a- anywhere else. I mean, this guy's a maniac and he's pathologic apparently. He, he talked his way out of apparently these issues at your hospital. No, he didn't. Let me just be clear, he did not. No, no, I mean... I on that, but I'm trying to stop this guy from being let operate too. anywhere, anytime, any place. I will call that. Okay, I appreciate it. Mm-hmm, thank hey, you. Thank you. Bye. Dr. Henderson never heard from Jerry Garrison again or anyone else from Baylor Plano. I wanted to talk to Jerry Garrison myself. I wanted to ask why they'd handled Dr. Dunch the way they did. But all I got back was this brief statement. Our primary concern, as always, is with patients. Out of respect for the patients and families involved and the privileged nature of a number of details, we must continue to limit our comments. There is nothing more important to us than serving our community through high quality, trusted healthcare. I think the failure of Baylor in this case or other hospitals in subsequent cases is just uh, uh, beyond words. Alan Shulkin was a doctor who sat on the Texas State Medical Board in 2012. After he got a call from a fellow surgeon about Dunch, Shulkin took the unusual step of reporting it to the board himself the first formal notification they received. But all this did was start a long, slow process. See, reporting a doctor to the medical board launches an investigation, which usually takes months. The speed at which they work gets a lot of criticism, but in most cases, that's not necessarily a bad thing. This is, after all, an accusation that could destroy a doctor's reputation and livelihood, so the investigation needs to be done carefully. But again, if the reporting had come from Baylor and they'd shared their findings, then the board could have used the information the hospitals had already gathered. 
And with an overwhelming reason for concern, they could act much, much faster. How fast? Had Baylor alerted the board right away? I would anticipate the board would have met within days to have an immediate suspension. Wow. And that can be done with or without notice. If somebody's so bad, the board can say, stop now. And then you can come back and tell us if, you're, if we're wrong or you're right, but stop now to protect the public. They, they let him go around March or April of, 2000, of 2012. So you're telling me that if they had notified the board, he could have been stopped within days of that. They should have done that. They shouldn't have been afraid to do that. What's the worst that can happen, a lawsuit? Come on, money? These are people dying. We're stopping because they're afraid of a lawsuit? I know you can't speak for Baylor, but I'm sitting here wondering, why would they protect him? Like, what did they have in it? They were going to let him go. So why, what would they have to gain by not reporting him? I have no idea. Maybe they, quote, don't want the hassle. I have no idea. And do you think this happens very often? Yes. Baylor's failure to report Dr. Dunch to the Texas Medical Board would later trigger an investigation by state health authorities. Baylor Hospital did pay a price. Well, almost. On December 10th, 2014, the state issued a notice of violation to Baylor and fined them $100,000. That wasn't enough. People died and continued to die. It's, it's egregious beyond words. It's a moral human failure. System's there to, make the, to stop this kind of thing. The people who had chance to make the system happen ignored it. A year after Baylor was fined, almost to the day, the notice and fine were withdrawn. I filed to obtain the records of what happened in between, but was told by the state they were confidential. The hospitals weren't doing anything to stop Dr. Dench. And without reporting him to the data bank, there was no way for anyone to know how bad things really were. And so Dr. Dunch was not getting anything on his record. That's Dr. Randall Kirby. Because Dunch wasn't getting reported, no one was connecting all the dots. But then Kirby had a chance meeting in the doctor's lounge of another Dallas hospital in July of 2012. He's a spine surgeon, I'm an access surgeon. Dr. Robert Henderson the doctor who had begun looking into Dench's background and who happened to be working at the same hospital at the same time. We have to sit in the same doctor's lounge while we're waiting for the rooms to turn over. And it's a small doctor's lounge at Pine Creek Medical Center. And, and since I knew that Dr. Henderson had done the recovery surgery on Mrs. Eford, I, I went and talked to Dr. Henderson when I saw him about what happened up there. Bad news travels fast in Dallas. He had uh, come in contact with other patients that had been uh, injured by Dr. Dunch. And he was uh, more intimately aware of what had happened out at the previous hospital also. He heard about my situation with Mrs. Eford. He's an extremely conservative, mature surgeon. He's not as outspoken as I am. And for him to get up this upset about something was is very, very unusual. The two make something of an odd pair. Kirby speaks in passionate flourishes. Henderson is understated and deliberate. They both decided to call the Texas Medical Board. And I said, like, listen, we've had egregious results at Baylor Plano. He was not reported to the day bank. We've had egregious results at Dallas Medical Center. And I said, he's got to be stopped. I told him I, that not only should he not be in an operating room, he should not be evaluating or interfacing with patients, period, until he was fully evaluated from both a mental and uh, capability uh, standpoint. And what did they say? They said they would get back to me 
and thank you very much for reporting the issue. And then the conversation was terminated. They didn't want to hear it. And so they didn't feel that they had enough to act on. They had two dead patients. They had a quadriplegic and a paraplegic. And that wasn't enough to act on. That wasn't enough for them to act. As it turned out, they weren't the only ones calling the board. There were a number of practitioners here in Dallas who were calling down to the Texas Medical Board saying, we've got a real problem with this neurosurgeon. And before this, how many surgeons or how many doctors have you reported to the medical board before? I've never reported anyone to the Texas Medical Board. And you've I've been practicing for how many years? 21. I mean, if I were you, I'd, I'd do everything I could to just uh, to just say, no, I can't recommend him at this time. A few weeks later, Henderson got a call from Dench's old fellowship supervisor at the University of Tennessee Medical School, Dr. Kevin Foley. Remember, Foley is the one Henderson talked to right after Mary Eford's surgery, when he thought Dench had to be an imposter. Foley was also an investor in the company Dench helped found. Discgenics. Christopher Dunch was applying to work at a new hospital. The hospital needed Foley, once again, to vouch for his credentials. And so I kind of chuckled and I said, well, at least you know what to do with that. But then Dr. Foley says he can't mention what he's heard in Dallas. He says, well, not really that simple. They're asking me how he performed during his time under my tutelage. He was under my tutelage for a year. He did about six months of surgery, and then he did about six months in research because he has a PhD, too. And he said he was fine. You know, I'd say he was average. Was he superlative? No. Was he, was he terrible? No, he was average. And that, that's all they're asking for. How did he do while he was under my tutelage? And I said, yeah, but don't they say, would you recommend him to be on your hospital staff? Or don't they? No, there's no questions like that. And I said, you mean there's not, none of those? Foley tells him that there's a box for comments. And Foley says when he got the same form from Dallas Medical Center, he'd written in that box about two problematic cases at his prior hospital that should be looked into. I said, there you go. Just tell him what you know. He says, well, all that's hearsay. I didn't see it. I said, well, use my name then, because you heard it from me. And I personally saw the damage that he created. He says, well, I really can't do that. Foley goes on to tell Henderson about the case of a doctor in Tennessee who tried to stop another doctor he thought was dangerous. The second doctor, the one being accused, sued the first and won. And he says, and... From my standpoint, I don't know of a physician that'll write a negative uh, reference letter uh, about another physician in Tennessee. And of course, I was flabbergasted about this. And uh, I just said, You're in a very unique position where you get notified every time this guy wants privileges someplace. And now you're in an even more unique position that you've, you've been notified that he had two catastrophic events at Baylor, and now he's had two catastrophic events, uh, you know, within six or eight weeks later at another hospital. And if that doesn't raise any red flags uh, for you or anyone else in your position that has some control over this. Dr. Foley says there are limits to what he can do because he didn't personally observe gross incompetence. But hospitals, he says, well, they're the ones who have the responsibility to check him out. I just have to throw that ball back into the Dallas court, Foley says. As the call goes on, you can hear Dr. Henderson's frustration grow as he tries to get Foley to write something on the form that will stop Dunch. I just said, do what you got to do, but I know what I would do. Um, and I would, uh, I would tell the truth and I would do everything I can to make sure this individual is enabled to not only diagnose patients, but surgically treat patients in the foreseeable future. Finally, Henderson lets Dr. Foley know he's got to go. Well, I've actually got that. I'm, I've got the patient I'm dealing with here in the office right now. They brought her in on a stretcher from the rehab center. So, oh, uh, The patient who's just arrived for a follow-up visit. Okay. 
is Mary Eford. Bye-bye. Dr. Foley wouldn't talk to me, and neither would anyone else from the University of Tennessee. I got a long letter about their unhappiness with previous news coverage about Dr. Foley's connection to Christopher Dunch. And then it said, Dr. Foley does not intend to give an interview in connection with this matter. Ellen DeGeneres has a new podcast out called Ellen on the Go. It's your audio catch-up of the week's Ellen show with a never-before-experienced glimpse at how the talk show comes together every day from the very minds that make it happen. It's incredibly fun and insightful, exactly what you would expect from the Ellen show. Because you're a Dr. Death listener, stay tuned till the end for an exclusive preview of Ellen on the Go. Listen and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Dr. Henderson and Dr. Kirby didn't hear anything about Christopher Dunch for a few months. They figured he was finally done, that his medical mistakes had caught up with him, and he wasn't operating anymore. Dr. Henderson and I, we always wondered where he went, but we didn't, we didn't hear any rumors in the grapevine from anywhere about him. But then, in December of 2012, Dr. Kirby got a call. I had the most static coming at me because I had privileges everywhere he operated. And so I worked with the same doctors and nurses that he was interacting with. The call was for Dr. Kirby to come help with a woman who had suffered severe complications from a cervical spine surgery. Her name was Jacqueline Troy. Her operation was at a place called the Legacy Surgery Center in one of the northern suburbs, but she had been transported by ambulance to a large hospital in Dallas. Her incision was severely infected, her vocal cords cut, and her windpipe had a hole in it. Dr. Kirby had a hunch about who'd performed the surgery. He said it was a guy named Christopher Dutch. It was. I knew the urologist that ran Legacy Surgery Center Frisco, and I called him, and I said, you guys better get him off staff as fast as you humanly possibly can, which they didn't. Jacqueline Troy survived, but today her voice is nothing more than a raspy whisper because her vocal cords never recovered. Kirby and Henderson kept hammering the medical board, but they felt they were getting nowhere. Then, six months later... I got an invitation to go to a nice restaurant here in Dallas, Old Warsaw, to meet with Dr. Dutch and to be introduced to him as their new spine surgeon at the University General Hospital. The hospital's called University General, but it's not affiliated with any university. It was once named Southampton Community Hospital, but was purchased by new owners in 2012. At the time, the move was welcome. The hospital, which had already been through two bankruptcies, is in southern Dallas, a lower-income part of town that's lacking in good hospitals. When Kirby got the invitation... I called down there and raised holy hell, but Dr. Chahadi said... That's the owner of University General. There was nothing he could do because he hadn't done anything really egregious down there at University General Hospital, which was a lie because he was having terrible results down there. But at least the owner owner of the hospital felt that if he let cut Dr. Dunch loose off the medical staff, that Dr. Dunch would sue him. So I'm guessing you didn't go to the dinner. I didn't go to the dinner. So Dr. Chahade told you there was nothing in the databank? Yeah, he sure did, because they checked. That was not true. I have the data bank report that they got, and it was clearly on there. Well, he won't. Talk. He hasn't returned my phone calls in two years Thank because you. because he he said, Randy, 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 we can't do anything about him. He's got a clean record, even though he's had these complications, and he's going to sue the hospital if we release him. Less than two weeks later, on June thirteenth, two thousand thirteen, 
Dr. Kirby's fears were realized. The hospital's owner called him. He goes, Randy, you're right. We've got a real problem down there, and you're the only one that can fix it. Jeff Glidewell had broken his back during a motorcycle accident more than a decade ago. Since then, he's been living on disability. In 2012, he developed a pinched nerve in his neck. When you get a, a disc that's pinching nerves, it's, uh, it feels just like getting electrocuted. He needed to find a neurosurgeon who would take his insurance. After consulting Google, he happened upon the website of Christopher Dunch. His website, uh, he was a PhD and a neurosurgeon, MD, and there was not one flaw on his website, uh, nothing but good reports and a list of accolades that were two pages long. There was uh, a YouTube video that was sponsored by Best Docs Network, and it looked like uh, he had won an award or was being interviewed or uh, being filmed to show how good a doctor he was. It's a miracle is all I've got to say about it. Dr. Dunch is one great man. He is I wasn't aware that they were a paid advertiser, paid to, to take care of his website. Dr. Dunch hadn't won an award. The video was an infomercial, slickly camouflaged to look like an honor. He is the best doctor, I think, that anybody could ever go to. And if you're having the problems that I had, you know, give him a call, because he'll fix you. And another thing, there's something off about Dr. Dunch's delivery. It just isn't as polished as the production around him. And that's due to a degenerative arthritic type disease in the bony elements and, and the joints uh, and disc uh, tissues of the spine. The, uh, that infomercial helped convince Glidewell that he'd found the right guy, even more so after he met Dr. Dunch in person. I was actually so happy with the way it went that I, I called uh, my wife and my mother <laughs> and said, I, find, I think I found somebody on my insurance that's gonna fix my neck. When the university general owner called in Dr. Kirby, he told him the patient had, quote, a retained foreign body in his neck. But it, it was a lot worse than that. Dr. Dunch was supposed to take a diseased disc out in the cervical spine. Dr. Dunch made an incision in the neck in the wrong place, totally disoriented. And then he went through the left lobe of Mr. Glidewell's thyroid gland, destroyed it. And then Dr. Dunch proceeded to cut through the side of Mr. Glidewell's esophagus, which is the food pipe that goes from the mouth to the stomach. And then he proceeded to drill a hole in the neck, lateral to where he should have been. He drilled a two ping pong ball size hole in the musculoskeletal pillar of Mr. Glidewell's left neck. And in the process, injured the left vertebral artery, which is a very, it's a big artery that bleeds profusely. And to stop the bleeding, Dr. Dunch took a sponge and shoved it in the hole. And then, Dr. Dunch had sewn Jeff Glidewell up, sponge and all. The retained foreign body, that was the sponge left inside his neck. When Dr. Kirby came in, he had Glidewell transferred to another hospital. I'm not ready for this. I really am not. I am wide, smoking away. This is gonna be like bad. Well, the problem is we've already started. Here he is enduring a nurse changing the vacuum tube going into his throat. Get it over with. Oh, yeah. oh. Ah. Glidewell did finally have the neck surgery he needed. 
in December of 2015, on Friday the 13th. He figured he didn't have any more bad luck left. It, nothing like this has ever happened in the United States of America. It may happen somewhere else, but there has never been any sequence of events that comes close to this. Even if he was impaired, intoxicated, and performed this horrible operation, he would you would think he'd want to get the patient to someone that could take care of the problem, and he didn't. He just disappeared. In that moment, Dr. Kirby decided this went beyond medical boards and hospital administrators. This was not an operation that was performed. This was attempted murder. This is a criminal act. This is someone that's intentionally hurting people. He got in touch with Dr. Henderson. It was time to notify the Dallas District Attorney. That's next time on Dr. Death. Whoa, it don't take no vacation in this land. From Wondery, this is part four of six of Dr. Death, an investigative miniseries about the system that failed to protect 33 patients in Dallas. If you'd like to help us spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, NPR One, and every major listing app, as well as Wondery.com. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find offers from some of our sponsors. Please support our show by supporting them. And thank you. Dr. Death was written, reported, and hosted by me, Laura Beal. Sound designed by Jeff Schmidt. Story consultant is Jonathan Hirsch. Associate producer is Pallavi Kutamasu. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louis, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. Here's a preview of Ellen on the go. My whole adult life, I used to feel like I had to have a man, and I want every woman out here to know, you absolutely don't. Amen, sister. I want women to know also, you don't need a man. (laughs) Hi, it's Ellen. Welcome to my podcast. We're going to listen to some of the best moments from the show. You're getting $100,000. And I want to see y'all for 12 days. It's going to be hosted by four executive producers that I love. I'm Ed Glavin. I'm Mary Connolly. I'm Kevin Aleman. I'm Andy Lassner. We're the executive producers of The Ellen DeGeneres Show. They have been with me from every, every single show, from the very beginning, so they know a lot. This is really the first time anyone has wanted to hear what we've had to say. I'm not sure if they even want to, Mary. Oh, well, that's very (laughs) true. And if they say anything that I wouldn't like, please tweet me. Turn off the news. Turn on Ellen. You will feel better. You can subscribe today on Apple Podcasts or whatever you're listening to us right now on. Happy listening.